Good evening and welcome to the second public meeting for the Coast Canyons and Trails Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan. My name is Kristen Byrne and I will be serving as your moderator for tonight's meeting. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Carlos Diaz who will be serving as our Spanish translator. Carlos. And good afternoon, buenas tardes. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas a esta segunda reunión pública para el Plan Integral de Corredor Multimodal de Costas, Cañones y Senderos. Uh, acaba de presentar usted Kirsten Byrne, quien también les da la bienvenida. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. Back to you. Thank you. Next slide, please. A few announcements before we get started tonight. Um, as you can see, our meeting tonight is being simultaneously broadcast in English and Spanish. Um, if you would like to follow the presentation in Spanish, a link to download the Spanish version of the PowerPoint presentation is placed in the chat. To access the Spanish interpretation, please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen to select the language you would like to hear the presentation in. To select, to listen only in Spanish, you should also click on mute original audio. If you are joining through the Zoom mobile app through a cell phone or a tablet, please press, press the ellipsis, the three dots at the bottom of your screen, then interpretation, and then choose your language. I will have Carlos uh, provide these instructions in Spanish, and then we will begin the uh, simultaneous interpretation feature. Thank you once again. De nuevo, bienvenidos, buenas tardes. Para aprovechar el servicio de interpretación al español que se ofrece para esta reunión, inmediatamente después de este aviso, en su barra de controles de Zoom, donde aparece su micrófono, cámara, etc., va a aparecer un icono de interpretación que parece un globito terráqueo, y ahí seleccionaría Spanish o Español. Ahora, si está utilizando una aplicación móvil, en celular, tablet, etc., presionaría primero los puntos suspensivos, más, luego interpretación, y después su idioma. Por último, para no escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, seleccione Mute Original Audio o Silenciar Audio Original. Gracias, and thank you, Kristen. All right, so we will be beginning the Spanish translation now. Um, a few virtual meeting guidelines tonight. Uh, this meeting will be recorded. Um, the recording of the meeting will be available on the project's virtual engagement hub shortly after the meeting. I'll get to more of that later in the meeting. Um, all of your microphones will be muted during this presentation. Um, if you have questions or comments, um, you can enter those at any time in the Q&A box. Um, rather than the chat, it's the Q&A box. Um, and all of those comments and questions will be recorded. And then we will have an opportunity at the end of the presentation where we will be um, answering those questions live and you'll be able to ask questions directly of the team members. Next slide, please. We uh, were fortunate enough tonight to get a video welcome from Supervisor Joel Anderson, and I would like to um, invite uh, staff to play that video right now. I want to begin by thanking you for taking the time to participate in this evening's meeting. This is the second public meeting for the Coast, Canyons, and Trails Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan. In addition to serving you on the County Board of Supervisors, I serve as a member of the Sandag Board of Directors. Santee Mayor John Minto has made improving State Route 52 his mission, and I want to publicly thank him for all his hard work. I firmly believe that good government demands meaningful participation of its citizens, so your involvement tonight is extremely valuable. You'll have the opportunity to hear directly from the project team on all the proposed improvements planned along the SR-52 corridor and adjoining freeways as part of the planning study. You'll also have a chance to have your questions answered and most importantly, an opportunity to provide your comments and ideas directly to Sandag and Caltrans staff. Thank you in advance to the Sandag and Caltrans staff for your presentation tonight and for asking for our community's input. Transportation impacts our quality of life, so it's important that we get it right. Thank you again for your participation, and let's get started. We appreciate Supervisor Anderson for providing us the opening remarks. And now I'd like to introduce Karen Jewell, a program, a Project Corridor Director from Caltrans to provide some opening remarks on behalf of Caltrans. Good evening. As Kristen said, I'm Karen Jewell, and I'm 
uh, the quarter, Central Quarters Project Director responsible for this area for Caltrans. This fancy title basically means that it's my job to ensure that Caltrans and SANDAG transportation plans and projects work together seamlessly. Thank you for joining this pro, uh, public meeting regarding scoping transportation solution strategies for the Coast Canyons and Trails Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan. As the owner and operator of State Routes 52 and 67, Caltrans is responsible for developing and constructing projects that ensure safe, sustainable, and efficient operation and maintenance of our facilities. In fact, central to our mission is to provide a safe and reliable transportation network that serves all people and, rep and respects the environment. With input from you, the traveling public, along with SANDAG, Caltrans, the cities of Santee and San Diego, the County of San Diego, and additional partners, the project team developed the strategies that you will see tonight. These strategies or the blueprint will pr prioritize the su and support future evolving needs for mobility and the transportation services. The CMCP process is guided by a couple of state documents and local plans that you will hear more about later in the presentation. On both State Route 52 and 67, they're key to the state transportation system and Caltrans in collaboration with SANDAG will continue to invest and improve these highways and their connections. A few current projects that are going on or are underway include a, an asset management project on State Route 52, which will repair the roadway dips near the Miramar landfill by compaction grouting to stabilize it. This project will also include other assets such as upgrading guardrails and also adding an auxiliary lane eastbound between 15 and Santo Road. This project is due to go to construction early 2023. There's also bridge preservation project and ramp re rehabilitation projects, both due to go out in summer of 2023. And environmental studies are underway for a truck climbing lane project westbound on 52 between Mast Boulevard and Santo Road. With your continued input on the strategies presented tonight, this corridor plan will include improvements to all transportation modes in our community to make it safe, efficient, and equitable. Thank you, and now I'll hand it back to you, Kristen. Thank you, Karen. We'd also like to welcome staff members from the offices of Supervisor Joel Anderson's office and the City of Santee. We really appreciate that you have um, given your time to be with us here tonight. So thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to give just a quick overview of our meeting topics tonight. We'll begin with um, a brief overview of the Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan. Sometimes you'll hear that referred to as CMCP, um, the overall program that SANDAG and Caltrans are working on. And then we'll dive into a little bit more detail about the Coast Canyons and Trails Corridor itself, including some of the key findings from the technical work that's been done over the last year and the public input that we received since our first public meeting. Um, after that, we will, uh, subject matter experts will be presenting draft transportation strategies that have, are being proposed in a variety of topic areas. And we will be um, conducting a number of Zoom polls uh, throughout that presentation, kind of sprinkled through to get your reactions to those uh, proposed transportation solutions. And then after the uh, transportation solutions presentations and the Zoom polls, we'll have our open Q&A period and we'll go over instructions for how we're gonna do that um, once we get there. But if you do have a question that you think of between now and that time, feel free to enter that in the Q&A uh, box and then we will be able to get to those questions once we get to that time period at the end of the presentation. Uh, so next slide, please. And to kick things off, um, we are going to do a polling question here that just gives you an idea of how the Zoom polls will work and also give us some information for Sandeg's Public Affairs Department about how you heard about this meeting. You can check all that apply. So did you hear about this via the Sandeg website, at another Sandeg meeting, the virtual engagement site, social media, Sandeg eblast, an other electronic news source, newspaper advertisement, an online advertisement, community group or another organizational meeting, word of mouth, or if there's any other ways that are not on the list, feel free to enter those in the Q&A box. I'll give you a few minutes or a few seconds, excuse me, <laughs> to complete the, uh, complete the survey. OK, 
Okay, it looks like we're not getting, uh, I'll give you uh, five more seconds and then we will share the results. All right. That's great, thank you. That information, it uh, sounds like social media and the e-blasts are doing a good job of uh, reaching people. And uh, let me see, and word of mouth as well. So um, thank you, that information will definitely be helpful for promoting future public meetings. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to now turn it over to Rachel Kennedy. She is the um, program manager for the overall CMCP program at Sandag, and she can tell you a little bit about the program itself. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you to all of you for spending some time with us this evening to learn more about this project. A comprehensive multimodal corridor plan serve as one of the early steps in, in, in implementing the regional plan. And this quarter plan builds on previous and current regional and local efforts to create a comprehensive transportation network that can improve multimodal connectivity across the corridor. The plan incorporates information from state and local documents, including the Sandag 2021 Regional Plan, the State Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure, the California Transportation Plan, and other local community plans. After a CMCP is approved, individual projects, programs, and policies outlined in the document can apply for various federal, state, and local funding opportunities, such as Senate Bill 1 funds. Ordinarily, a, a, a package of projects does uh, not receive funding all at one time, but rather over uh, a course of multiple years. Once funding is secured, the project will be added to the Regional Transportation Improvement Program, which is a multi-billion dollar five-year program of major transportation projects with secured funding. From there, additional environmental analysis, design and construction is needed to make these projects a reality. On the next slide, we can see a closer look at the process that is being followed by this and other quarter plans. We started by defining the corridor characteristics to get an understanding of how people and goods move through the corridor. Then we analyzed performance gaps and opportunities. And using this information, we identified transportation solutions, which is the focus of our meeting tonight. Once the transportation solutions are complete, we will start to develop an implementation strategy that aligns with the vision of the 2021 Regional Plan. And now I'll hand the presentation over to Michael Lubin, who is the Caltrans project manager for this corridor plan, uh, to get an overview of the Coast Canyons and Trails corridor. Michael? Thank you, Rachel. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Next slide, please. The map you see before you is the same one shown in the first polling question. The study area in dark green incorporates the full length of State Route 52 from La Jolla to Santee, in addition to the southern freeway portion of State Route 67 at the east end that extends to Interstate 8, as well as all major arterials that feed into the freeway system. This represents the main focus of the CMCP studies and improvement recommendations. Besides State Route 67, State Route 52, as an east-west freeway, has connections with other major north-south routes in the San Diego region, including from west to east, Interstate 5, Interstate 805, State Route 163, Interstate 15, and State Route 125. We have been coordinating with all stakeholders, including the cities of Santee, El Cajon, and San Diego, as well as the county. Also, community-based planning organizations and our military, Marine Corps Air Station, Miramar, and the Navy. Our transit partners for bus and rail, including Los Angeles Rail Corridor Agency, North County Transit District, and Metropolitan Transit System, they've been consulted as well. This allows for an inclusive plan that speaks to the whole community. We're also analyzing data from the larger travel shed that includes the entirety of the census tracts crossed by the study area, creating the area of influence you see in light green. The data analysis for the CMCP considers the impact of the area of influence on the study area as part of the transportation network. Moreover, we have two intersecting CMCP efforts in progress, the 805 South Beta Sorrento that crosses our corridor and the 67 San Vicente CMCP that overlaps as the 67 freeway 
transitions into a conventional highway at Mapleview Street. In evaluating the interactions between these CMCPs, we are coordinating with the respective project teams in order to avoid any inconsistencies. Next slide, please. So by developing and implementing this plan, we can achieve the following goals. Improve transportation safety, develop and preserve an accessible multimodal transportation system for all users, promote and practice environmental stewardship, support a vibrant economy, foster livable and healthy communities that promote social equity, advance efficient, resilient and innovative approaches in developing and delivering transformative projects. So these goals are ambitious and multifaceted. Without a good plan, however, they cannot be achieved. We are setting the stage for future projects that will advance these goals and the goals of the region, making San Diego a model for others to follow and putting us on a path of sustainable and equitable growth. I'll hand the presentation over to Mimi Morisaki, the Sandag project manager for the CMCP to provide an overview of key findings and the public input we've received thus far. Thank you, Michael. We held our first public meeting last year to present information about the plan and gather input from you about mobility challenges in the corridor. And we also completed a comprehensive technical study to understand the key issues. We found six key themes related to, to the corridor as listed in this slide. We understand that the corridor consists of sensitive landscapes such as slopes and canyons, parks, and a nearby military facility, and that the corridor also consists of disadvantaged communities. And this is shown in four main areas of the corridor that have the opportunity for additional transit options. And those areas include UTC, Kearney Mesa, Santee, and El Cajon. For example, near UCSD, UC San Diego, we have a higher youth population that may be more comfortable using transportation like bicycles and e-scooters uh, compared to the higher senior population we found in Tierra Santa that would more likely use shuttles or ride hailing services. We also noticed that there is a demand for transit from the east end of the corridor to the west end and vice versa. However, there are a few transit options available to facilitate this. Similarly, this travel market correlates to the peak travel times during the average work week where 65 to 75 percent of travelers in this corridor move west during the morning peak hours and then move east in the evening peak hours. Another key finding is that collisions were generally concentrated on roadways and occurred for all modes of transportation such as driving, biking, and walking. Our findings are also influenced by the over 400 comments we received on our virtual engagement hub after our first public meeting last summer. Most of the comments were related to active transportation and included suggestions like extending the regional bike path that's parallel to SR52 and creating more bike connections to the transit and mobility hubs. We also received comments on the freeways, like improving freeway interchanges, and there were mixed comments in favor and against expanding SR52. Comments on transit were related to improving the travel times and providing better connections between the Midcoast Trolley and Coaster. So these are some of the main themes we found from the comments and we drafted solutions to address these issues and concerns, which Seth and our experts will discuss next. Thank you, Mimi. Next slide, please. So based on prior plans, your input, and data analysis, the team has developed many improvements and strategies throughout the corridor. And we have organized those improvement strategies into the different categories shown here. Together, they create a multimodal network of strategies that complement one another. In the interest of time, we'll have each of our leads give an overview of the proposed improvement strategies in each category. And in a few days, we can go to the project website and review these strategies in more detail. Next slide. We'll start with the transit strategies, which is led by Phil. Thanks, Seth. There are a couple of key concepts you need to know for this plan. The first is Next Generation Rapid, also known as Next Gen Rapid. 
It's a fast and frequent bus service that uses transit priority measures such as dedicated bus lanes and priority at traffic signals. The second key concept you should know is on-demand microtransit. This is a shuttle carrying up to 15 passengers that provides rides within a defined service area, but operates without fixed routes or schedules. It arrives when summoned by a smartphone app. Next slide. Okay. The draft strategies include three proposed next-gen rapid routes to connect residents of East County communities with key employment centers, Kearney Mesa, UTC, UC San Diego, Torrey Pines, and Sereno Mesa. Building on the freeway-based transit strategies on SR52, the draft strategies also include a number of next-gen rapid routes on arterial roadways, such as Claremont Mesa Boulevard and Balboa Avenue, among others. We are also proposing on-demand transit called microtransit in areas that would be harder to serve with local bus routes because of lower demand for transit or disconnected street networks that make it difficult to walk or roll to a bus stop. With all the proposed transit strategies taken together, which we really just summarized here, there are seven new connections to the region's top three largest employment centers, eight new next generation rapid bus routes, nine upgraded local bus routes, and 31 square miles of on-demand microtransit. All right, thank you, Phil, for that presentation. Um, before we jump into our poll questions, um, I wanted to uh, make an announcement. There were a couple people who uh, posted in the Q&A that the survey function was not working for them. Um, I have let people who are on the back end of the meeting know about this, uh, and if we can fix it, we can. Um, if for some reason your survey answers are not working, um, you can go ahead and post your answer into the Q&A. Um, we apologize for this. Um, we're trying to fix it, uh, but in the meantime, if it doesn't work, if we could ask you to participate that way, that would be fantastic. So uh, we have a couple of questions to get your reactions on the transit strategies that Phil just presented. The first one is just on a scale of one to five, how well do these proposed transit strategies connect key destinations in the corridor? With one being does not connect well at all to five connects very well. And if you do have any sort of specific comments you'd like to leave for us, please feel free to post those in the Q&A. Um, and so I will uh, give us a few seconds to um, participate in this poll. And once again, for those of you, if your survey is not working and you want to put in the, the uh, Q&A, thank you, I just saw one pop up, uh, that would be great. Looks like we've had about half of the participants uh, join the survey, so we'll give it another 15 seconds and um, then we will share the results. Okay, why don't we go ahead and share the results? So it looks like um, we have a 
one person who thinks we're not connecting so well with a, a two, a number of people who think that connects moderately well, um, and, and also a number who a little bit better than moderate, but not quite all the way there. Um, and a couple people who um, posted in the comment in the Q&A that we think that the, it connects very well. And we had one comment um, posted, uh, the UCSD student says a direct bus route transit connection from campus from campus to Convoy Street area would likely be heavily used by students. The restaurants on Convoy are a very popular hangout spot for students. So thank you all for those comments. And we will go on to poll question number two. So if we could go to the next slide. Excuse me, poll question number three. So here we wanna hear from you about how local transit services could be improved to make transit more attractive than driving. And we'd ask that you pick your top three choices. Um, and those choices are increasing transit frequency, providing more tra transit options, increasing the speed to make transit more competitive with driving, increasing connections, services to get you from transit to your destination, better pedestrian bicycle connections, reduce uh, the need for, trans for transfers, reduce fares, provide accurate up-to-date travel information, improve safety, and then if there's anything uh, that we have not listed here and you uh, would like to share with us, you can enter something other in the Q&A. Okay, we've had about a little more than half of the people uh, participating, so we'll give it another uh, 15 seconds or so, and then we will share the results. Okay, why don't we share the results? It looks like all the answers have come in. Great, so it's the most popular is to increase speed and that transit needs to be more competitive with driving, um, followed by transit frequency is also an important uh, component here. We had a few um, additional comments in here. Um, somebody said that we need to make transit clean and sanitary, regularly clean, seats, rails, and floors. And then another who wanted point-to-point uh, -point convenience and connectivity of all the different types. And we need to look at specific examples. Riders may follow the path of least resistance. Let me see if there's another that has come in. Uh, if driving is faster, that will be the usually be the chosen option. So that uh, backs up the increased speed being important. Um, and uh, Deborah Knight, you said that asked for comments in the chat on improving transit connections. We'd actually like comments in the Q&A rather than the chat, which is where you're commenting. So, and then one more, one more comment from a UCSD student that the only thing keeping transit from being faster than driving uh, to school for him are the 15 minute headways for the blue line. If this were doubled to seven and a half minutes, um, I would not need to deliberately time my commute as much and could rely on the train coming much more quickly on average. All right, thank you all for those great comments. Let's move on to the next slide, please. All right, and now we're going to move on to freeway 
corridor strategies, and um, I'd like to invite Charlie Hetland to um, present these slides to us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for the freeway corridor, we are proposing a few key concepts that are aligned with the regional plan. This includes managed lanes, which is similar to the uh, Interstate 15 corridor, and these offer priority access to people using transit, carpooling, or van pulling. This will help more people move faster, reduce traffic congestion, and increase transit ridership. This concept will also be complemented by freeway to freeway ramps that provide seamless direct connections at several major intersections, interchanges along the corridor. We also are proposing truck climbing lanes. This provides an extra lane that's used for short distances in uphill areas to improve safety, ease congestion, and prevent de delays. Uh, these lanes will help facilitate the passing of trucks and slow moving vehicles on steep grades. We have also identified several uh, freeway operational improvements, which are shown on the next slide. The purpose of these uh, operational improvements is to reduce traffic congestion and improve safety. So starting at the West End, the first operational improvement are traffic related improvements along westbound State Route 52 to northbound Interstate 805. We are also proposing a merging lane for eastbound traffic um, to exit to the Mass Boulevard off-ramp. Uh, again, we have the, the westbound truck climbing lane um, in, the, in the westbound direction. And then we have an additional lane that we're adding along SR-52 between Mass and uh, SR-125. All right, I think we're gonna turn the presentation over to Seth Torma right now to present roadway corridor strategies. Thank you, next slide. So the roadway strategies include some of the following key concepts. The first is flexible lanes, which give carpool and transit users priority. As in this example, in the image on the right, which is from Fifth Street in downtown San Diego, during rush hour, this parking lane is designated for carpool and transit use only. Additionally, we'll, we'll be proposing signal coordination, which improves traffic and vehicle flow along key corridors. And in addition to that, we'll be proposing a number of transit priority areas, which give buses a uh, head start at intersections, traffic signal priority, and other improvements to, in speed to improve those bus speeds. Next slide. So this map is illustrating the various locations of these proposed roadway strategies. We will leave it up here for a moment so you can see where these roadway strategies are proposed, which span from the west side of Genesee Avenue to the east side of Cuyamaca Street. Okay, next slide. So in summary, the plan proposes 18 miles of freeway safety improvements, 13 miles of freeway managed lanes for carpooling and transit, 10 new freeway to freeway managed lanes to complement those managed lanes, four new operational improvements, two new freeway ramps that will be improved, or two, new, or two freeway ramps, excuse me, existing freeway ramps that will be improved, and 17 new roadway improvements. Next slide. Thank you, Seth. Okay, now we have a couple polling questions on uh, freeway and roadway strategies. The first being, what do you think are the most important priorities for creating complete corridors that can accommodate multiple modes? And you can pick your top three. And again, I would remind you if you um, if the survey function is not working, we ask you to answer, enter your comments into the Q&A. Um, these choices are dedicated lanes for transit, protected bike lanes, HOV lanes, incorporation of technology to improve traffic flow, dedicated parking and charging spaces for EVs, electric vehicles, safe routes for pedestrians. And if you have anything other than what is included on our list, we invite you to post that into the Q&A.
we've had about two thirds of participants uh, submitting their answers so far. So we'll give that a few more seconds and then share the results. All right. So it looks like our most popular were safe routes for pedestrians, followed uh, by protected bike lanes and dedicated lanes for transit being our most popular uh, priorities. And we did have one comment in the Q&A asking if these, um, these uh, priorities would increase roadway traffic. So, and that's something maybe we could address that in, in during the Q&A session after the presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is an open-ended question. Um, are there other highways or streets in the corridor that should be considered for complete corridor improvements that Seth, Seth and uh, Charlie, dis excuse, yes, Charlie discussed? If you could enter that into the Q&A, if there are other corridors that you think should be considered for these types of improvements. Okay, we have a comment coming in HOV technology or HOV technology and protected bike lanes, um, bi directional managed lanes. That seems to be answers to the uh, prior question. Okay, and there's a couple other questions that have been entered and we will get to those when we get to the Q&A section. Okay, I think we can move on. Next slide, please. All right, I would like to introduce Andrew Prescott, our active transportation subject matter expert, and he will uh, discuss the... Great, thank you, Kristen. So our proposed active transportation strategies serve to improve conditions and maximize connections for people that walk or ride bicycles throughout the study area. For pedestrians, we have a toolkit of operational and infrastructure crossing enhancements that will focus in those higher activity areas, such as near major transit stops or uh, major destinations. So features like high visibility crosswalks, signal improvements and curb extensions will help make pedestrians more visible to drivers and give pedestrians priority when crossing. For bicyclists, we want to have a complete network that really increases safety and the comfort of people using bicycles. And this will be achieved through uh, facilities or bikeways that are physically separated from cars. So this image depicts the four recognized bicycle facility classifications. And on the left of your screen, you see the class one bike paths and on the far right, class four cycle tracks. Those are the two uh, types of facilities that are physically separated from vehicular traffic. So we'll look at those a bit more in the upcoming map. And here we see our proposed bicycle network. So those class one bike paths shown in the orange, those class four cycle tracks shown in that pink or magenta color. And we started with the existing bicycle facilities and the currently adopted planning documents from jurisdictions throughout the study area. And then we then identified opportunities for additional connections between the SR52 bikeway, which is that orange line paralleling SR52 and two adjacent communities. Two of these new connections will provide great separated crossings of the SR-52 so pedestrians and bicyclists, bicyclists can cross SR-52 without interacting with vehicular traffic. We also looked at strengthening connections between communities and two transit stations. So this planned network will provide options for people to comfortably ride bicycles between Lakeside all the way out to La Jolla while improving access to different destinations along the way, such as the Santee Town Center, 
uh, Convoy Street, Kearney Mesa Employment Area, Claremont Town Square, UTC and UCSD just to the north of our study area. And this slide summarizes the change in bicycle facility miles. So as shown, we have large increases in those two separated bicycle facility categories, the class one bike paths and the class four cycle tracks. And some of those cycle tracks will be implemented by improving existing bike lanes. So that's why we're seeing a bit of a decrease in bike lane mileage overall. Uh, in total, we anticipate this being a, an addition of about 72 miles of new bicycle facilities in the study area. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. So we just have one polling question for this active transportation session uh, section, excuse me, and we want to know how well uh, you think that these proposed active transportation strategies address your concerns about the increasing um, safe active transportation facilities. Number one uh, being the lowest that this does not address it at all to five being the highest of it address as well. And if you do have any specific comments you would like to leave us um, about this rather than just a, a ranking, we invite you to uh, post that in the Q&A. Um, Okay, we've had about two thirds respond so far, so we'll give it a, uh, another 10, 15 seconds. All right, so it looks like um, the majority of you feel that this moderately addresses um, concerns about active transportation with a decent number uh, saying that uh, in that number four um, and one vote in the Q&A for uh, it being five that it addresses very well. And then we had one comment where possible more roundabouts should be considered like the ones in Bird Rock on La Jolla Boulevard. Cars drive slower and it's more friendly to pedestrians. Thank you everybody for your input. Next slide please. Right, I'm going to turn this back over to Seth Torma to talk about uh, our strategies with respect to mobility hubs and flexible fleet. Thank you. Next slide, please. So mobility hubs are key locations where enhanced first and last mile connections and other amenities are provided to facilitate transportation options, especially transit. These enhancements include things like pedestrian infrastructure, improved bicycle infrastructure, electric scooter and e-bicycle infrastructure like parking and sharing locations, space for ride sharing, card sharing services to connect to those destinations that are further out, and even electric vehicle charging. Next slide. So at key activity centers, these mobility hubs have been proposed and the pink dots on the map show the locations of those key locations where these services we just described would be provided. We'll pause here for a moment so you guys can take a look at the map. Okay, next slide. So in total, the plan proposes 23 new mobility hub locations, 920 acres of pedestrian improvement areas, and 14 new electric charging station locations. Kristen? Thank you, Seth. All right, we have two polling questions here for this. The first one, another ranking question 
from a scale of one to five, how well do the transportation hub locations, excuse me, the mobility hub locations meet the travel needs of the corridor? One, it does not meet them at all. Number five, meets the travel needs well. And if you have other suggested locations where you think mobility hubs should be considered, please enter those into the Q&A box. We've had just under half of you participate in the poll, so we'll give it another 10, 15 seconds. All right. So it looks like uh, the majority of folks are saying that we uh, these mobility hubs address um, address the travel needs fairly well with the four being the most popular answer and uh, about th uh, three of you uh, also uh, said that they meet it very well with five, uh, two on this survey and one in the uh, Q&A box. So let's move on to the next slide, please. So we wanna get a sense of what flexible fleet options and the uh, services you would use the most. Um, would that be something like uh, car share, like a zipped car service, scooters, like Lime scooters, a neighborhood shuttle, ride share, like an Uber pool, bike share, such as e-bikes, ride hailing, like Uber or taxis. And if there's others that you uh, would like us to know about that are not on here, then please enter that into the Q&A. Okay, just uh, just about half of you have participated, so let's give it another 10-15 seconds. All right, it looks like the neighborhood shuttle and ride share, like an Uber pool, are the most popular. Um, with others putting bike share and ride hailing as things that they would use. Excellent, thank you so much. Next slide, please. And for our final section on the transportation solutions uh, presentation, I'm going to introduce Don Murphy, who will talk about the role of technology in improving transportation. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, as you might imagine, technology has application across all of the solution areas that we've been discussing as part of this uh, meeting. But we wanted to highlight a few areas uh, of the technology solutions that, that stand out or overarch uh, these uh, areas. So uh, the technology functions for the corridor, uh, we tend to call them uh, part of the next OS or the next operating system. And this can kind of be seen as the brains of the mobility and transportation network. So it's the thing that links the data and the information and the services across modes and really enhances our ability to make the most of these infrastructure improvements we've been talking about. So it has some key goals and that's to allow the more flexible and efficient use of our transportation network and to enhance safety. Uh, to provide more seamless options for travelers and provide enhanced uh, information on their traveling, both pre-trip and during and post-trip. 
uh, prepare the region to make the to make proper and effective use of emerging technologies. As everyone knows, technology moves very rapidly. So part of this is to position us so that we can make the best and timely effective use of emerging technologies as they become available. We also want to enhance safety, uh, both from a perspective of just day to day, as well as improving incident response. And we also need to support emergency evacuation needs as it might relate to uh, portions of East County that might utilize the corridor during uh, significant emergency situations. Next slide, please. So just as a highlighter summary, uh, the, the solutions in the, in the drafted in the current uh, study represent 24, more than 24 new miles of freeway technology or advanced uh, enhancements to our freeway technology, including portions of 67 and 52, uh, as well as 50 um, plus miles of enhanced technology on our roadway uh, to provide for more flexible use, as well as to provide for enhanced communications and enhanced uh, signal systems and improvements in operations. There's also a series of overarching functions that support all of the operations. So in terms of enhancing our ability to monitor the uh, use of the mo uh, mobility and transportation network to make the most efficient, effective use of it over time, to exchange data between services, to provide uh, seamless services to end user customers that uh, need information about how to make trips, how to pay for trips uh, across different modes. And then finally, uh, there's the opportunity as part of this study and the, and the solutions to remove some of the broadband uh, infrastructure gaps where there's been gaps traditionally in providing high-speed internet access to community for equity purposes. And with that, we can pass it back to Kristen. Thanks, Don. Could we go to the next slide? Okay, we, here we are on our final polling question of the evening. Um, what are the most important issues that transportation technology should be focusing on to improve travel throughout the corridor? And we ask you again to pick your top three. Provide more HOV lane capacity during congested travel period, periods. Give priority to transit vehicles incentivizing transit and alternative transit choices, bike pedestrian priority signals and detection, integrated app for trip planning, booking, et cetera, real-time information for trip planning, real-time information for emergency response. And if you have any other suggestions other than what's on our list, you can enter those into the Q&A. Okay, we've had a little over 50% of you participating, so we can give the rest of you another 15 seconds to uh, enter your answers. All right. Well, this one's interesting. It looks like uh, a lot of these choices uh, seem to be equally important to a lot of you with HOV lanes, priority for transit vehicles, incentivizing transit, bike, bike ped priority, an app for uh, plant trip planning, and real-time information all have about the same um, amount of uh, popularity here. So, and I did not get any additional comments in the Q&A box. So if we could move to the next slide, please. So we'd like to thank you all for sharing uh, your input via our Zoom and the comments that you've entered in the Q&A. Um, public input is critical to this planning process and we wanna share some additional ways that we'll be um, allowing you to, uh, seeking your participation so that you can share your thoughts about transportation issues in the corridor. What you see here on this slide is a, a screenshot from a portion of our virtual engagement hub. Um, and uh, this uh, hub is dedicated to providing updated project information um, and opportunities for you to participate. 
on this virtual engagement hub, there's a comment uh, form where you could ask a question, submit a comment, uh, anything that you would like to be considered during the planning process. And then in the next couple of days, uh, the video of this meeting will be posted on there. So if you know folks who couldn't make it to tonight's meeting but did want to get the information, they'll be able to view that video. There will also be an interactive survey that will be posted on this site in the next couple of days um, that will allow you to answer the same questions that we posed here today in this meeting. So this is an excellent opportunity for you to help push this out to others that you know are interested in these issues. Um, and to provide their input through that, that survey. And that survey will be open through July 13th. So we have two weeks from tonight um, that we are, are asking people to share their input. Next slide, please. Okay, and now we uh, come to our question and answer period. And I believe we have um, 25, 30 minutes. Uh, I think we're doing okay on time. And so we have a number of questions that have been posed in the Q&A. And I will um, be reading these questions and then uh, giving those over to the appropriate subject matter expert to um, answer those questions. And you continue to enter questions as you have them, um, but we can go ahead and get started with what's been uh, posted in there first. Um, so the first question was, how many of these new bus routes will serve Tierra Santa? So I think that question should go to Phil Lacombe, our transit expert. Thanks, Ryan, for the question. Uh, none of the proposed next-gen rapid routes would travel through Tierra Santa, mainly because there aren't many through streets. Um, but three rapid routes would use the adjacent freeways, I-15 and the 52, um, adjacent to the Tierra Santa community. And any of those rapid routes, any of those six rapid routes could potentially have uh, stops on the freeway, uh, depending on how they're designed, that Tierra Santa re residents could uh, connect to by local bus, bicycling, walking, some kind of other flex flexible fleet mode. That answers your question. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Uh, so the next question, is there a link to the PDF of uh, this presentation? And I can answer that. Um, it will be posted, a link to the uh, both the English and Spanish versions of the PDF will be posted uh, after the meeting on the virtual engagement site. And you will get another opportunity uh, in a future slide where that address for the virtual engagement site will be posted. So um, this next question has <laughs> multiple parts. So um, I will read all the parts and then I will uh, send it to uh, the person who I think can answer the first one. And then we may need to go to some other subject matter experts. How much of the improvements on SR52 are alternatives to avoid traffic on, on 15 and eight? Is there an analysis uh, of pass-through versus local use? What are the problems trying to resolve? And I do not see how the improvements impact the environment climate issues. So I'm going to have Karen uh, Jewell with Caltrans start with that one. Hi, okay, so this has a few parts here, um, but the analysis, uh, we're doing modeling. We haven't uh, completed that yet because we're trying to make sure that we've got the right solutions first. We've done preliminary um, analysis and then that modeling will occur. So in terms of how many are trying to avoid 15 and eight, um, I'm not sure the congestion on 52 seems like that would be the people that want to go straight through. And there might be also people trying to avoid the 52 and going south on uh, 67 or, or one of the surface streets getting onto I-8 and then trying to go north on 15. So that's, that's very possible. That's more of an origin destination, which we did go through that analysis um, to try and, and come up with some of these solutions in the first place. So when you say, um, I don't see how improvements impact the environmental and climate issues. I think the biggest thing that we're trying to do is our first priority is to avoid or mit and minimize our impacts to the um, climate change and environmental. So we're gonna try and look at solutions that will stay within the footprint of the roadway. Uh, that would be our, our first goal. And um, so when you're saying that they don't impact, that's great. I'm glad you see that. And hopefully we will be able to do that if 
when any of these projects go into um, the studies and, uh, and trying to implement them. Thank you, Karen. Um, I, and I apologize for this, but I am having technical difficulties on my computer and um, I am, my controls are not working. So I am going to have to ask another member of the team to jump in to um, ask these questions while I try to fix this. I apologize for this. Um, Seth, is there any way you can uh, jump in and ask the questions? And then, um, well, I try to fix my computer issues. No problem. I'm so sorry. No problem at all. Let me just open that up. I think the next question I see is um, from an anonymous, anonymous attendee, all these, I think, solutions will increase roadway traffic. And, the, and no is the, is the question. And I think we're gonna hand this over to Rachel Kennedy to answer, Rachel. Thanks for the question. Um, so our intent is not to increase uh, traffic or, or roadway traffic, but to provide people with different choices that they can use for accessing their different destinations throughout the corridor um, and connect to destinations beyond the corridor. So uh, we're looking to provide people with uh, different options and different ways that they can travel to get where they need to go. Um, another thing to note is that in our next phase of the project, um, as Karen just mentioned, uh, once we've received input from all of you and, and other members of the public on these draft transportation solutions that we're sharing tonight, we'll be putting them into our travel model. Um, and that helps to show different things uh, about how they would perform in the future. So looking at different elements uh, like person travel time or uh, mode share, how many people are using different types of improvements uh, that are being proposed, um, different elements looking at um, air quality or greenhouse gas reductions or vehicle miles traveled. So we are going to be using some modeling tools to look at uh, how these different groups of projects projects are projected to perform together. Um, but, you know, the intention is to give people more options to get where they need to go um, in a comfortable and, you know, time effective manner. Thank you, Rachel. The next question is from Mark. Is there somewhere we can see the details such as the location of the proposed improvements to existing roads and maps? And I think I can answer that question. The answer is yes. We um, have provided a link here to the website. And in shortly, in the next few days, we will upload um, the content from tonight and share that with the community so that uh, you can look at the various concepts and solutions that we propose tonight in detail. The next question is from Tim Balash. Tim asks, how do e-bikes and tandem e-bikes fit into the plans? And I can go ahead and answer that question. Part of the strategy here tonight that we proposed and illustrated were uh, included mobility hubs. Again, mobility hubs are key locations, often um, uh, uh, strategically located at transit stops that provide additional amenities uh, to really help promote the ease of use of transit and multimodal options. So providing those first and last mile enhancements is key at these locations. And in order to do so, we provide a number of amenities like improved pedestrian areas, improved bicycle connections and infrastructure to those locations. And then as part of those strategies as well, uh, space and room and location for um, electric bikes, electric scooters, and other uh, services that are like that. And so it's key to the plan to uh, it's key to the plan to dedicate a space and room for those strategies like e-bikes into and throughout the system. And we located 23 new mobility hubs proposed throughout the plan. And again, that map uh, will be uploaded uh, in the next few days to the website so that you can take a look at that in detail. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. Um, will any of the bike improvements help connect to mountain biking in, I think that's Penasquitas or PQ Canyon and the Trans County Trail? And I'll go ahead and hand that over to Andrew, our uh, Active Transportation SME. Andrew? Thanks, Seth. Thank you for the question. Yeah, that's uh, Los Penasquitos Canyon. Um, 
popular mountain bike area. I've been to the PQ tunnels myself a few times. Um, so those are both a bit north of our study area. Um, P the PQ Canyon and the Transcontinental County or Trans County Trail both run uh, just south of SR 56, um, which is kind of between Carmel Valley and Sereno Valley. So while those are a little bit outside of our study area, um, I think some of the improvements that we're proposing will help access those still. So at the west end of our study area, we have um, connections to the, the Rose Creek Trail or the Rose Creek Bikeway, as well as the planned cycle track on Gilman, which will lead you up north towards Torrey Pines Road and accessing that kind of western end of the Trans County Trail. And then on the far east side of our corridor, um, our study area kind of ends in a lakeside area right near SR 67. And actually a separate uh, CMCP was just completed or is in draft form for that corridor. And we tie into that nicely and there'll be a, a class one bike path that kind of hugs SR 67 and would feed right into that Trans County Trail. So yeah, we're hoping um, our improvements will, will complement those in the San Vicente corridor, that SR 67 corridor, as well as at that Western end to, to improve access to both those areas. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. The next question is from Ryan. Ryan asks, a park and ride lot in Tierra Santa that is serviced by these new bus rapid transit routes would be great. Uh, Ryan, thank you for that input. That's the kind of input that we're looking for here tonight. And we'll go ahead and note that and um, look at that as an opportunity as we um, go into the next phase of this project. Lynn Alamond asks, with millions of dollars on deposit from East County residential developers for the expansion of Highway 52, what year specifically Will the stretch from Mast Boulevard to SR-125 be expanded to three lanes in each direction? Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Karen from Caltrans. Karen? Hi. So um, as I mentioned earlier, that project is in the environmental phase right now. And those the funds, as well as we've been working closely with the city of Santee, um, to keep that project moving forward. And uh, we're hoping those funds will also carry it through the design Currently, there is no construction funding, so I can't give you an exact date until we have that funding secured. Um, but I know that there's a lot of grants and uh, proposals that we've been uh, going for to try and raise that those funds so that we can go ahead and go to construction. Uh, the environmental phase and the design phase will probably be at least another two, two years, two and a half years, something in that range. Okay, great. I'm just going to give it a moment here because I think that is the last open question that we have at this time. I'll go ahead and pause. Okay. Are there any further questions here for the team? We'll go ahead and wait a moment. And I see that we have two participants with raised hands. Please enter your comments or questions into the Q&A function that you can see typically at the bottom of uh, your Zoom controls. Okay, we have a question here, perhaps. <laughs> If there's a question coming, Ken, let us know. We'll wait another moment here for other questions that might come up.
Okay, it looks like we may not have any further. Okay, another question just came in. Ryan, are there any, Ryan asks, are there any plans to update the convoy off ramp along SR 52? Lots of traffic with trucks going to the dump. That's a great question, Ryan. And actually we do have a very specific improvement identified at that particular location um, for that purpose, uh, exactly that purpose. We've identified uh, as part of the freeway ramp strategies, um, that particular intersection or interchange with uh, a convoy and the SR-52 for a further review by uh, Caltrans to start that process really in the very short term to look at opportunities for improvements that are uh, would be necessary to improve that particular uh, uh, heavy truck use and situation at that off ramp or that uh, uh, on or that ramp in general. Okay, if there are no other questions, this isn't your last time to provide input. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. And Seth, uh, I am back with technical capability again. Uh, <laughs> thank you dear, for uh, jumping in there when everything went awry. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank Good you. Night. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So the next steps uh, in this, this summer, um, the team will be working to revine, refine the transportation strategies using the public input that we've received here tonight and what we will be able to get through the virtual engagement site um, and the survey and any comments that we receive through there. In late summer 2022, um, the draft CMCP will be completed and that will be available for review and comment on the virtual engagement site we will be sending out um, notif e, -not e blast notifications to people who have participated that that will be available and uh, so that you will know it's there. And then finally, in the fall of this year, the final CMCP uh, will be completed and uh, we'll move forward. Next slide, please. So that concludes our presentation tonight. Um, and as you can see on this slide, there are a number of ways you can keep in touch with us. Um, there is the website, sandag.org slash cmcp. Uh, that's the Sandag um, website for the overall CMCP program and links to the virtual engagement hub uh, are on that website. You can also see um, that the uh, virtual engagement hub address is down here. That's the sandag.mysocialpinpoint.com slash coast canyons and trails address. Uh, we have, uh, you can send email, uh, phone or text messages to us if you have questions or comments. And then all of the social media handles for both Sandag and Caltrans are listed at the bottom for Facebook, uh, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. So that concludes our presentation and we really appreciate you being here tonight and for uh, your patience with some of our technical difficulties. And uh, with that, we wish you good night. Thank you for being here. <laughs>